Hello, everyone. I'm Donna Merck, Director of the Art Museum. And I'm excited to welcome you to today's Lunch and Learn featuring villain Volkers and pieces from our current exhibition, Compelling Visions, selections from the Willem and Diane Volkers Contemporary American Folk Art Collection at the Missoula Art Museum. The exhibit includes a selection of pieces that Willem and Diane donated to the Missoula Art Museum. But before I introduce Willem, we'd like to thank the Missoula Art Museum for lending these works to the exhibit and to acknowledge John Albrantz for giving permission to use his research and writing on the Volkers collection in this exhibition. Further, we want to acknowledge the support of the South Dakota Arts Council and of course, South Dakota State University and share our gratitude for all the museum members like you who make possible all that the South Dakota Art Museum um, does in terms of programs and exhibitions. So thank you so much. A couple of housekeeping things. The museum staff is here to assist you during today's program. So should you be experiencing any technical difficulties, you can contact Carolyn Hart and we'll put her cell number in the chat or you can call the museum main line. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Willem Volkers. You'll have seen Willem's name in connection with two exhibitions currently featured at the museum. Today, he'll be speaking from the role of collector, but we do hope you'll plan to join us on February 25th to meet Willem in person at the museum as he discusses the pieces he created, which are currently featured in the museum's special exhibition, Willem Volker's The View From Here. The reception opens at 4.30 p.m. and Willem's talk is slated for 6 p.m. Willem and Diane Volkers live in Bozeman, Montana. They began to collect folk and outside art in the 1970s. The Volkers met at the University of Washington in the 1960s, where Willem was working on his BA degree in studio art. He became fascinated with Simon Rodia's Watts Powers in Los Angeles, and after he and Diane moved to Kansas City, when he accepted a teaching position at the Kansas City Art Institute, they began their collection of folk and outside art. From the late 1970s to the present, they have amassed one of the most important folk and outsider art collections in the country. Welcome, Willem, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, Donna. I appreciate it. And I, I want to uh, thank you and uh, the staff, uh, Taylor and Jody, for inviting me into your midst and helping me install the exhibition. I think both the folk art and my work look really good in your in your gallery. And so we think I, so I'm too. Very <laughs> that you all have been very you've all been very cooperative and 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 wonderful to work with. You're real pros. So it's been a really great experience. Um, so we're going to talk about our uh, some of our uh, folk art collection today. Indeed. Um, I first learned about folk art environments. These are uh, places that uh, untrained artists have built in their yards, often outside, primarily in the 1960s when I was in school at the University of Washington. And one of my professors showed us a video or some slides, I can't remember, of the Watts Towers. And uh, I was totally bowled over. I'd only recently re-immigrated from from Holland, I'd served two years in the Dutch Army and uh, came back to the United States uh, to, to start school at the University of Washington and had ne never seen anything quite like the, the Watts Towers. So at the first opportunity, I got in the car during a spring break and drove to Los Angeles and found the Watts Towers and photographed them extensively. At this point, Simon Rodia had a deeded to property to a neighbor and had left and nobody knew where he'd gone. So I never got to meet him. But it got me started looking at folk art and folk art environments throughout the United States. And a few years later, after graduate school and a year at Ohio State, I started to teach at Kansas City Art Institute. And um, it turns out that there was quite a a strong interest in the in the Kansas City area for this kind of phenomenon. And so Diane and I would get in the car and sometimes with students, sometimes without, 
and start uh, looking at this phenomenon, uh, primarily first just the environments. So there were environments in Missouri and in Kansas, and then we started to venture further south uh, into the deep south, actually, in Georgia, and that's where we first met Howard Finster. I started to do some research um, and discovered during the bicentennial, especially in, in 1976, that um, that a, a number of states and regions in the United States were doing survey exhibitions of the folk art in their in their backyards. And these exhibitions were usually organized by folklorists who are traditionally trained and were looking at more traditional kind of folk arts. But often they would include a few people in the exhibition and in the catalog that they thought, well, they somehow fit in, fit in. We don't know quite how, but it would include people like Howard Finster and others who didn't quite fit the traditional model, uh, but they felt that they should be included. So in um, 1976, I took a sabbatical and Diane and I, uh, with our then seven month old son, Jason, we got in the car, we drove into the deep south and uh, it started to track down some of the artists that I'd found in some of these catalogs. Howard Finster was one of the uh, first ones. If you you want to bring up Taylor? If you want to bring up, bring up Taylor. If you want to bring up uh, an image of uh, Fitz's work. So we're going to be looking at something called the Devil's Vice. Um, Howard Finster had been a preacher, uh, primarily in Alabama, uh, a kind of a roving preacher in Baptist church, and. Um, when he uh, he eventually moved to a small community called the Penville community near Somerville, Georgia, which is northwest of Atlanta. And he built something called the Paradise Garden. And the Paradise Garden was basically based on biblical scriptures, which he kind of visualized in sculpture and um, uh, found object um, um, uh, 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 sculptures. Um, and I should point out that there are some the basic divisions within folk art. I'm using that term as a generic kind of term. There's folk art, which is primarily done within a tradition. So that people have inherited something from parents, grandparents. Quilt making would be a good example, a certain way of carving, etc. And so, and, and then there is um, naive art. These are artists who think they want to paint and sculpt in a traditional way, but don't have the traditional skills or art training. And that's generally referred to as naive art. And then there is the outsider art uh, kind of category. This uh, term was coined by my friend and colleague, Roger Cardinal, who taught for many years at the University of Kent in uh, Canterbury in England. And on a Fulbright uh, in the 90s, 1990s, I, I stayed with him and had some wonderful conversations with him. He, he passed away a couple of years ago. But those are the three uh, kind of divisions or areas within folk art. I use folk art generically because um, I want to bring people kind of in uh, and not get too bogged down in terminology. Uh, but for an audience like, like you, uh, I think it, it behooves us to kind of talk a little bit more in detail as to what each of these categories entails. Uh, but many of the artists that we're gonna be looking at would fit uh, primarily in the outsider area, I think. Those are the people who are a little bit more eccentric. They're sometimes, um, developmentally disabled or have some emotional kind of issues, which um, uh, drives them in a, in a kind of a different otherworldly kind of direction. Um, here's Finster's um, The Devil's Vice. Finster was a very articulate and intelligent man um, who, um, when we first met him in 1977, 
had just started to paint. He had he, he first built the Paradise Garden. And after he finished the garden, he went, he built himself a studio in something in a building that he called the World's Folk Art Church. And uh, he had a big space in there, which was his studio. And he would come in every day and paint. And he had just started to paint. And some of the paintings were nailed to the facade of his, of his uh, buildings. And we pointed out a painting that we really loved and would love to take home with us. He said, no, you don't want, uh, you don't want that one, you want this one. And I kept on saying, no, this, the, there's this one painting that we really love to have. And he took a claw hammer and uh, pulled it off the wall. And um, it is a painting, it is now in the collection of the High Museum in Atlanta. Um, but the piece we're looking at here in the exhibition of Devil's Vice, is a pretty good, pretty good example of him sort of preaching through his sculpture. So the devil's vice is a nice pun. He uses um, the uh, vice um, as a, uh, a device that you might find in, in somebody's shop. And then the vice, V-I-C-E, uh, as, uh, as talking about the, the, the vice trapping you in, in vice. Anyway, these are meant to be read and um, um, and he continues to kind of kind of pre preach through his work. So let's uh, oh yeah, and there's Howard on the left there. And uh, the painting that we originally bought from him was nailed to that building. At the time that we first met him, he was still um, doing a bicycle uh, and TV repair as a living. And uh, it wasn't, a t and when we first met him in 1977, he said, well, I don't have much time to spend with you because I'm doing some paintings for the Library of Congress. And I thought, sure you are. And it turns out that he was because later, a couple of years later, I was in a meeting at the Library of Congress and I saw some of these paintings that he painted for them. But then um, over the years, and I knew him for 20 or 25 years, he became increasingly well known and uh, books were written about him. He was on a Johnny Carson show and he started to sell more and more of his work as he was able to sustain himself and his family through the sale of his work. So let's go to um, Dexheimer. So Elva Jean Dexheimer is a man who, uh, a friend of ours, David Dunlap, uh, who was one of my colleagues at the Art Institute, uh, discovered on, his, on a drive down into the Ozarks. Uh, Dexheimer lived uh, in a town of Syracuse, Missouri, lived in a trailer. He had had a childhood accident. He had fallen off uh, of a tractor and had hurt, uh, got pretty badly kind of hurt. And so he was, he only went to school through, I think, the eighth grade, but he's essentially uh, illiterate. And, 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 and so uh, he started to, uh, in his yard, construct all these wonderful sculptures out of uh, found materials. And you see that image on the left here. There's his trailer and all these things that he built. And uh, as I got to know him, I found there was a whole shed full of paintings. And uh, among, among them, this painting that you see here. And the title Cat Sand is sort of an in, indicative of uh, what he what he did because he was illiterate he would copy um, letters and words without necessarily knowing exactly what he was copying and I have a feeling he's probably here copying an image from a comic book or something like that uh, and it's probably something like cat man or something like that I've never been able to figure out exactly um, a lot of his materials uh, or all of his materials actually were recycled. And so he, his brother worked at a local shoe factory and would bring home samples or, or leftover bits of leather and, and uh, shoelaces and things like that so, and, and pieces of cardboard from boxes. And he would always take these um, pieces of cardboard and trim the little corners off. You see how they're trimmed and that makes them more I think of an object more than uh, just a piece of cardboard. 
and um, they would just get painted at the hardware store. And I love the kind of graphic simplicity. I I'm sometimes reminded of of Matisse when I when I look at his work. There's a beautiful graphic direct simplicity to his work um, that is uh, pr pretty astounding. And I think. Um, What's wonderful about all these these artists is that they they don't really know the rules about making art. They didn't go to art school, um, and uh, so they don't have certain and they they don't really know about the art world. They generally have not been to museums, and so they will um, um, kind of invent their own ways of of making making art. And that gives it a kind of an impetus, a kind of a directness that really is uh, visually quite exciting. And, 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 and that's why I think we were so taken, Diane and I were so taken by, by this kind of work. And as we um, visited the environments, sometimes the artists would also make, like, like Dexheimer would make paintings or things or small sculptures that we could take home and collect. Um, but it made us interested in artists who, who made smaller things that we could actually collect while we were documenting, we photographed extensively the environments. So we traveled throughout the United States uh, and later in Europe as well, documenting these environments and interviewing them by interviews are now in the collection of the Archives of American Art, which is part of the Smithsonian. And um, a, a, lo a lot of the uh, documentation, the slides that I took are in an archive called Spaces. And this California archive has just been absorbed by the Kohler Foundation, the, the plumbing fixture family that has a large um, um, folk art museum in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And they uh, collect work uh, by these kinds of artists. So let's move on to, um, let's see, Mark Nagus. Uh, I learned about Mark Nagus through a, a uh, letter he sent me. It was a wonderfully decorated letter, illustrated um, and typed. Uh, it's a real treasure. And he introduced himself through this letter to me. He lived, I was teaching in Kansas City. He lived in Blue Springs, which is a, a small town near Kansas City. Um, he is either bipolar or schizophrenic. I've never been able to um, understand exactly, but he was basically unemployable and uh, has spent uh, the first 50 years of his life living at home with his mother, um, making art. He's very, very bright, uh, very articulate and reads a lot. And much of his work, I think, is based on, on myth, um, and stories that he reads um, so that they're very mysterious as in this this piece, a fabulous pu puppet for thoughts from the deep. Uh, it's um, it's a it's a, 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 a sculpture that can be moved that that fish moves actually up and down within that figure. It's beautifully kind of carved. It's only about oh four inches tall or something like that. And the reason that uh, it's fun to see this piece in the show is because not too long after I met him, I was asked to jury an art show in his hometown of Blue Springs. And he had submitted this piece, in the show, unbeknownst to me, he'd submitted this piece to the exhibition. And um, the jurors and I decided that it was unique enough to give it first prize. And so, and then uh, I bought it out, out of that exhibition. Uh, Mark uh, and I uh, became longtime friends. Um, I would, uh, Diane and I would visit him in Blue Springs. Um, and he corresponded with us over a period of about 
oh, 40 years or something like that. And I kind of lost contact with him a few years ago, but I'm still in touch with his brother. I'm not quite sure what's going on with him, but he's becoming more isolated, I think. He's not communicating quite, quite as much. Uh, but over the years, he would send me something in the mail and I would send him a check. And I said, next time you have something, send it to me. And so I've got a, a pretty large collection of, of uh, uh, letters he wrote me, uh, small sculptures. He even made an eight millimeter movie. As I said, he's very uh, he's a very passionate, uh, intelligent man. Uh, he actually traveled with his family. They went to England and Scotland one time. And so he would come back with experiences that he then would uh, depict in watercolors, small paintings, and small sculptures. A very, very wonderful artist. Should we move on to uh, Robert E. Smith? Robert E. Smith is another person who introduced himself to me. He had heard that I was going to speak at the opening of a survey of Missouri folk art at the University of Missouri in Columbia. And um, he had been included in that exhibition. He thought that I might like his work. So he sent me a painting very elaborately um, wrapped in brown uh, paper and lots of twine. Uh, I actually took a photograph of the package because it was so elaborate and interesting. And it revealed a wonderful little painting. It wasn't this painting, but I became really um, intrigued by, by his work. And at the opening, I realized that uh, this is a man that I wanted to collect. So I bought, I think, from that exhibition, another three of his paintings. Um, and, and they were not very expensive. And I should point out that we, over the years, have paid very little for, for this work. I mean, we paid uh, a, f a fair price to them, but it wasn't like hundreds of dollars. I mean, um, the most I think ever paid was $1,200 for a piece by Ned Cartledge, who was a carver in Atlanta. Uh, but I think a lot of these pieces were 50 or 100 bucks or a couple hundred maybe. Um, so a lot of work by R Robert was, um, uh, as I think he was diagnosed as a schizophrenic. And in the quote unquote early days, he was actually sort of incarcerated in a mental institution from 1950 to 1965 or 68, I think. And then was suddenly released. And they, in those days, they didn't give them much support. Um, so here he was out on his own and had to make a living. So he sold Amway products, among other things. And he tried all kinds of ways of making a living like he would record songs and send them to Hollywood, but he would also paint. He started to paint in the institution. He lived in Springfield, Missouri, and uh, I would visit him uh, from time to time, and he would also send me paintings. This particular painting is actually autobiographical. It's called Schizophrenia Ward Number 39. And so uh, he is depicting here the space that he inhabited, uh, probably like a common room uh, with a doctor in the background and a nurse and all his uh, co-inhabitants. And this is done on a piece of illustration board. Uh, I used to supply him with uh, a primarily illustration board uh, and sometimes canvases because um, he didn't have, never had very much money. And then when he would finish something, he would either send it to me or I would go to Springfield and, and, um, and retrieve it from him and, and, and give him a check. Um, he, be he became quite well known. He died a few years ago, or died 10 years ago, actually. He died in 2011. Um, but the city of Springfield kind of uh, embraced him and had him paint murals in, in the city. And 
and uh, he has had a number of exhibitions at, 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 at museums in that region. He's included in a number of books. So he actually got quite a bit of attention, whereas somebody like Mark Nagas, whom we saw previously, um, except, uh, except for exhibitions that I curated, has hardly ever been shown um, uh, by, any, by any museums or public institutions. But, uh, but uh, Robert E. Smith uh, became quite well known. And I uh, brought him to Kansas City um, uh, one, at one time. And then when I moved to Bozeman, uh, we brought him here as a visiting artist. And he was in the gallery for a day painting. And the students could watch how he painted. And uh, it was, he, he came on the bus. He liked traveling by Greyhound. And he had he brought four duffel bags with him for like a three day visit. So it was pretty. He, 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 it, there, there was a certain kind of un, uncontrolled kind of quality about him uh, that was very kind of endearing. Uh, he had he had four cameras with him, none of which worked. Things like that. But he was a wonderful artist, very inventive, um, and as I said, a lot of them are autobiographical. So they talk about him and his life. And, oh, I should mention that he he also wrote stories with all of these paintings. So I have, for each, for each painting that we collected, I have a handwritten story. And I even have tapes in which he actually reads the story. And as he reads it, if in, there's an example of where um, there was water uh, somebody was swimming so he'd get a pan of water and i was in the room when he was recording this he'd get a pan of water and slosh it around and hold the microphone nearby so you could get the sound of water so these recordings are really quite wonderful and the stories are wonderful and they're all handwritten uh, and and they often take three four or five pages to describe and he get all the everyone in in these paintings has a name uh, many of which i think are made up uh, but uh, but they they're they're real people to him. Uh, he, I think they are crammed. There's a lot of people crammed into his paintings. And I think he's filling a void. I mean he he was this man who was his his stepfather rejected him. Uh, he was thrown out of the army. He was institutionalized. So I think he uh, until he became a little older and became more embraced about his work. I think he was a, a kind of a lonely man. He was filling the void by uh, filling these paintings with with quote unquote friends. You know, these, this is his family. Okay. Brenda Clements is someone I never met. Um, I bought this, and I think the the jug is about the only piece of that we collected. It was in a, an antique store in Belgrade, Montana, which is close to Bozeman. And, it, and when I first saw it, I was fascinated by it, but it was hundreds of dollars. And I thought, I just can't afford that. And so, but I kept on going back to that, that antique store. And one day it was, for, it was available for $25. And I said, gotta have it. Um, it, we refer to this as a memory jug, uh, which is basically an African tradition that they uh, are uh, anthropologists think were the tradition was brought from Africa by slaves. Um, and in Africa, the graves were often decorated with jugs with objects. That had been that were broken in order to release the spirit of the individual uh, after they had died, and so when the uh, slaves, the, Af the African Americans, came, uh, they continued that tradition in this country, and it's considered to be primarily an African American tradition, and I'm not quite sure how it was transmitted uh, to uh, a more Caucasian culture. I, I saw a photo of Brenda Clements one time, and I think she's, I'm pretty sure she's, she's Caucasian. 
but it might have been something she had seen somewhere. And maybe it was a parallel event where she just invented this thing thinking it was unique to her. Uh, anyway, this is a large jug. It must be uh, oh, uh, almost two feet tall, something like that, not quite maybe, uh, decorated with objects the tradition that it's made in uh, people would use objects from that person's life and so this is very descriptive these are the kinds of things that one might find in brenda clemens life things that she had collected things that were around the house things maybe she'd had in childhood uh, it has quite quite a strong presence um, and um it weighs, it weighs a ton. Not only is the jug, is there a big jug underneath there, but all these objects, of course, add to it. Um, I ha um, have tried to track Brenda Clements down. She was supposed to be living in Bozeman or the Bozeman area. And even last night, I thought, well, let me try one more time. And uh, I, I looked on the internet and contacted somebody and she sort of vanished. So I, I have no idea um where, where she is i wish that I, I i knew her or had gotten to meet her diane and i've tried to meet many of the artists as i've told you most of these artists that, that we've been looking at today and in our collection are people that we actually met personally sometimes even spent spent time with spent the night with or certainly spent hours with talking and photographing and sharing stories um it is to us, I think, a lot more meaningful if you're kind of familiar with the artist, you know something about the, the context in which things were made, um, the kind of their background, their story. And so we've always made a, an attempt at getting to know them. And sometimes I've found things that seem to be uh, anonymous. One time I bought a whole collection of small wood carvings, uh, but I tracked. Uh, I found out that the antique dealer had bought him at auction. I found out who had sold them, which turned out to have been his daughter. And her, his, the artist's daughter was, was cleaning, cleaning up, cleaning house, literally, and had sold them. And so I got the story through by talking to his daughter. And so um, I, I, as much as I was able to throughout our collecting career, we've tried to track down individual artists and uh, talk to them and get to know them. I think uh, that brings us to the end of specific examples. I think we're probably uh, open, um, available for, be glad to answer any questions you might have or comments. Yes, you're welcome to unmute and ask questions, or you can uh, put them in the chat, and we'll be happy to share those. Uh, this is Leanne. Um, Mary Ellen and I were just wondering on that Brenda Clements, what is the media that she used to stick all that stuff on the jug? Oh, good question. Um... I'd have to, I actually not quite sure. Uh, can we can we bring up Brenda Clements again? <clears throat> yeah, you can't really see the glue. It probably is something like a glue gun, a hot glue gun, I would guess. In uh, in the Afri African American examples, um, they often will embed objects into uh, cement. So they'll add concrete or cement uh, to a jug and then embed objects into that. Uh, but I'm guessing that somebody like Brenda probably would have used um, a hot glue gun. Thank you. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. 
for questions or comments. Willem, Donna, it's Taylor here. Donna's here asking if you're still actively collecting. A uh, good question. Uh, actually, we're divesting. Um, I'm at, at a point in, we're at a point in our lives where we need less stuff and not more. Of course, sometimes I can't resist picking up something, but um, about three, four, five years ago, we started to contact museums um, and other collectors to get some ideas of what to do with the collection. We had hundreds and hundreds of pieces. And um, I had take, I went, we met with uh, a curator at the Smithsonian who had worked, who had had a job as a curator at the Kohler Foundation, at the Kohler Arts Center, I should say. So Ruth Kohler and her brother inherited the Kohler Plumbing Fixtures Company. Uh, and she decided that her brother should take over the running of the business and she would uh, uh, take, take the money. And uh, she started a, an art center um, in Sheboygan, the John Michael Kohler Arts Center. And um, it was started in the original uh, family home to which uh, they added the large structure and recently have uh, built a whole new um, building as well. Um, and they, uh, I should say that Ruth was primarily interested in first in uh, very regional kind of environments. So she started to uh, document and look at uh, folk art environments built in Wisconsin. And then as the artist died, she started to provide the money and the conservation expertise to conserve those, uh, like Fred Smith is a well-known site uh, in, in, uh, in, in Wisconsin. And, uh, and then as time went on, she went further afield and she started to um, put her money and time and effort into preserving environments in other parts of the country. Um, there's an environment in, um, in Georgia that they spent $2 million on um, uh, repairing and they used my photo documentation from the 1980s to help them uh, place objects in the right spot and get the colors right and things like that. Um, so I'm very, very pleased that I, I originally started to document this just to be able to uh, bring some information home with me, share with my students, give some lectures, etc. And and now um, uh, about seven thousand of our slides ha are uh, in the collection of the uh, Kohler Foundation and they're being um, scanned and put online. Um, anyway, Ruth Kohler spent her, all her, her money and her career, and she turned out to be the, the 50, 51st richest person in the United States, it turns out. And we had dinner with her a couple of years before she died. Uh, and um, she had this tremendous love for uh, folk and outside her art and, and built a whole, um, uh, system for preserving and and um, documenting that kind of work. So Diane and I approached the Kohler Foundation to see if they might be interested. And as we were kind of negotiating with them, our friend Sam Gepmeyer, who is a museum, who is from Bozeman originally, and he became a uh, museum administrator. And he... Um, uh, he 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 was uh, he had museums throughout the United States over his career. He's about to retire, but um, he uh, decided to apply for the job of director when Ruth Kohler was becoming ill about oh, seven eight years ago, and started to withdraw from active participation in the museum in the art center they opened up the job and he applied and got the job as director of the Kohler Art Center. And when he 
realized that Di and I were about to donate our collection to the uh, Kohler Foundation, he said, I want it for our collection. So they, we gave the Kohler Art Center almost 400 pieces. Uh, um, but then um, at the same time, the Missoula Art Museum, which is our favorite uh, contemporary art museum in Montana, uh, um, knew of our collection. They had shown it several times. And Brendan Rankes, who is the, uh, the senior curator, asked uh, if we might have some pieces that we could donate uh, to them. And so we um, uh, donated them uh, to them about, I think, 38 pieces or something like that, of which you have just seen examples. And then there was still some work left and we had shown our collection as it traveled a couple of years ago at the Halley Ford Museum of Art in Salem, Oregon, which is a wonderful museum on the campus of Willamette University. And uh, they showed an interest. And so we gave them another 40 or so pieces. And so there's very little left now. Um, and uh, occasionally I'll go online, I'll see something, or I'll go in a secondhand store and I'll go, oh boy, I've, I've got to have that. So occasionally I'll add something, but not very often. So most of it is, um, it's, it's being dispersed or has been dispersed. So Willem, we have reached one o'clock. We have a couple of questions in the chat and I'll, um, I'll bring those on, but for anyone who needs to leave, we totally understand and appreciate that you've been able to join us today. Um, Frank Franklin was asking, uh, besides Finster, who else did you visit in the Southeast? Oh, um, among others, Columbus McGriff in Cairo, Georgia. Um, I'm trying to recall. Um, Eddie Martin. Eddie Martin is the environment that I mentioned earlier that was uh, that Ruth Kohler helped um, support. And he was a wonderful eccentric kind of individual who died a few years ago. I started to learn about these environments in the 1960s and 70s. And so often by the time we started to visit these artists, they were already a little bit older. And indeed, a lot of them have, um, have died since we started to document them. But we spent, um, oh, there, was a, there was a wonderful uh, hand-painted house by a man named uh, Creek Charlie, Charlie Fields in Lebanon, Virginia, that comes to mind. Um, so the South is particularly rich. Uh, and um, we would sometimes uh, find people in catalogs. Uh, and uh, one time we, 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 the catalogs wouldn't always mention specifically where they lived to kind of protect the artists. So we would go to the county seat and we would go to see the sheriff or the local police department. And we'd say, and we'd show the work. And we'd say, have you ever, ever, do you know this man? And they would say something like, well, yeah, he works at the lumber yard, but I didn't know he was an artist. And so I said, well, where does he live? And he said, follow me. So we'd follow the sheriff and we'd often go um, into a part of town where suddenly the streets are no longer paved. Um, like Columbus McGriff, um, a black artist, uh, lived obviously in a kind of a black kind of ghetto uh, in, in uh, I think it was in Georgia. And we had trouble finding, finding his house. And so um, uh, we would follow the sheriff and the sheriff would say, there, there's the house, you know? And so, uh, we, we, over the years, developed a network of artists and curators throughout the country who were in this phenomenon. Now, there's a long, by now, long history to the development of this field. In the 1960s, when we became interested, there, there were no galleries, no museums showing this work, really. Um, and now there are museums like the Museum of American Folk Art in New York and uh, the Kohler Art Center. Uh, 
and the Milwaukee Art Museum has a sizable collection. Um, the High Museum has a sizable collection, but that didn't exist back then. So we developed a network of people who uh, shared with us a love for this kind of work. And we would often contact them before going into an area. Like one time we were going into Boone, North Carolina, and um, we contacted an artist on the faculty at Appalachian State, and he'd done some research and documentation. And, um, and so he would give us leads. And so that's how we got, got a lot of leads and we would share leads uh, as well. And so then as time went on, people started to buy and sell this kind of work, galleries got involved. There's now quite a network of galleries throughout this country and Europe as well that show and sell this kind of work. So things have changed immensely. There's, uh, I, I have written a number of articles for an, a magazine that comes out of England called Raw Vision. Some of you may know that. I wrote an article for the first issue that came out in I think 1988 or 89, something like that. And, um, uh, and there's the um, Folk Art Society of America, uh, and they have a publication called the Folk Art Messenger. And, and there's books being written and people get PhDs in this area now. So the, the field has emerged and developed tremendously over the last 40, 50 years. Thank you. Um, Bonnie Levian had a, a wonderful uh, proposition. She says, I propose an alternative interpretation of the cat sand title to cats and dogs spelled cats and apostrophe D with the then parentheses OGS. So, so a cats and dogs uh, oh, variation that is great. really yeah, quite witty. I like that, Bonnie. That's great. That's yeah. great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, and then uh, Lynette asks if you could uh, give the three kinds of folk art that you mentioned again. Yeah. Um, so fo folk art, the, the term folk art, which is now used kind of to uh, cover a, a very broad, too broad an area, essentially deals with people, with artists who work in a certain kind of tradition. That tradition may have been brought over from Europe or from Africa. Uh, it may be uh, tied to a grandfather or grandmother. It might be a certain way of quilting or carving, etc. cetera. Uh, so, but you can usually, it doesn't mean that artists, that, that folk artists don't add their own flavor, their own personality to that work, but uh, the the root of it is based in their their culture and their traditions. The na naive artists are those who um, uh, want to embrace kind of the Western art tradition, uh, which they've seen in in books, perhaps or magazines, uh, but don't have the schooling or the training to 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 do it in the traditional methods. And so uh, they're not used to dealing with perspective or uh, certain kind of size relationships or, or whatever, or even for that matter, with the materials on which most artists paint. So they may take font materials to paint on and they may invent their own way of depicting their world or their dreams. There's also, an area that's uh, in within folk art that's referred to as visionaries. These are people that that deal with their dreams and their visions, and that are kind of really otherworldly. And then the third main category is outsider art. These are artists who live outside the mainstream. Um, they live outside the economic mainstream, social mainstream, very often. Um, and uh, are often kind of defiant in, in their personalities. And um, they kind of often even kind of, kind of lash out, if you will, uh, against a, a society that has mistreated them. Uh, I would even include in that uh, somebody like Jesse Howard, who, who some of you are familiar with, who was a sign painter. Uh, 
not in a traditional sense, but he painted what look like signs that are texts that take out after politicians and neighbors and people that he uh, didn't agree with or or had a had a, uh, a disagreement with. And um, the outsider artist is the is the most fascinating and the, but also the most difficult sometimes to uh, define um, because they lead such different kinds of lives. They they live, as I said, outside the mainstream. They may be mentally disabled or uh, developmentally disabled um, and live on the on the fringes. But I find that they depict worlds that otherwise I would not be not have become familiar with. So they give me insight into a world that otherwise I would not get to see. So I very much kind of admire them. They're sometimes a little hard, a little hard to befriend, uh, as I kind of implied earlier as well. But um, I think their work is powerful and intense and very passionate. These people make art um, because they have to. They, uh, it's not like somebody says, oh, you should take up drawing or you should take up painting in your retirement. They are just compelled to make stuff. Uh, and sometimes their whole garden's full of sculpture. Uh, and sometimes their paintings, sometimes their sculptures, etc. Well, thank you. I don't see any more questions. This is last call for questions, but I would um, encourage all of you who've enjoyed this to come back um, on Zoom if you're remote and in person if you are local on the 25th. At, uh, from 4.30 to 7, we'll host the reception here at the museum. And from 6 to 7 Central, uh, Willem, Willem will be presenting and, and that will live stream through Zoom. So you'll be able to join us for that as well. And my wife, Diane, will also be there. That's great, yeah. Taylor, did you well, have thank any- Thank you all for being there. Oh, I I, wanted, I just wanted to say that I appreciate all of you logging on and, and, be, or, and being in the gallery. This was a real fun, fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Willem. Thank you, Willem. Thank you, Willem. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.